we kind of um, share and talk a lot with a lot of teachers and students um, in the UK and kind of across the world. And what I was really interested in is the ideas that you talked about and kind of the the ideas that I suppose you took from Phil Ramone and developed and refined in your career um, Mm. in psychoanalysis. How do you think some of those ideas might fit into the classroom where instead of the producer and artist relationship, you've got the teacher-student relationship? Yes. Because I've, I've definitely noticed when I'm teaching that some of those ideas, especially you know the kind of validation mirroring prizing the things you talk about um, and i'll I'll make sure when we share this video that we i put some of these these concepts up um how you could see those working and say potentially you know in a classroom setting where maybe you have got larger groups of students i just wondered if you had any insights about that because it sort of struck me that maybe some of these ideas could be really valuable to teachers helping helping the next generation of music students for example yes yes absolutely so, um, first of all, if we understand the way that the brain works uh, and we understand the amygdala, which is this little walnut in the middle of your head, which is there basically to scan the horizon for danger, uh, and when it perceives danger, it turns on what's called the autonomic nervous system, which prepares you for either uh, fight or flight or freezing, right? So. Uh, but very often in the modern world, the amygdala misperceives danger, it thinks something is dangerous, and, 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 and then it turns on. Uh, you could just be sitting in a classroom. You're not going to get eaten by a saber tiger, but you're yeah. afraid you're going to get humiliated, let's say. You know, yeah. that you'll expose yourself. You're going to fail. You're going to give the wrong answer. You're not going to perform well, or whatever those things happen to be. So when um, the amygdala gets really triggered, and this is also dependent on what your experience has been in your, in your previous life, the more trauma you've gone through, the more this is likely to happen, the connections within the brain kind of turn off. Right. So the, the access to your forebrain, your human brain, the brain that knows the difference between past, present, and future, and that speaks English, kind of gets severed. And then you're kind of like an iguana, right? Right. (laughs) So essentially what happens in those situations is you cannot learn. Right. And that can take any one of a number of forms, right? So somebody, the teacher asks the student for the answer to a question and they can't access the answer. They know the stuff, but they can't access the answer. Or... um, I have a couple that's sitting with each other and they're in a conflict and they're triggered, right? Yeah. And, and you can't get through to your husband. Like, no yeah. matter what you say, you know, <laughs> yeah. well, that's because he's hearing rah, 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 rah. He's yeah. not hearing English. He's an yeah. iguana at yeah. that moment, right? <laughs> and if you're accessing, if, 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 let's say, performing is um, dependent on your body being in a particularly relaxed state, if you are run you know preparing for flight <laughs> you're mm. not going to be in that state right so yeah. you can't take and if you're getting direction let's say from your from a teacher they're trying to work with you on improving something if you can't if you're triggered you're not going to be able to learn you're not going to be able to incorporate that information mm. and utilize it in some way so so it's a it's a tricky thing because on one hand it's absolutely necessary that the student feel safe in order to learn mm. at the same time you're challenging the student because you're asking them to do things that they're not necessarily good at or yeah to to learn things that they don't know which is inherently an anxiety producing sure right so when i'm working with um uh, with couples for example or in families the first task is to make them feel safe and heard so that's that's why um, you know, it's always good to lead with the positive. Yeah. Uh, you know, the great producer Arif Martin would always say, "That was great. Let's do another one." Yeah, <laughs> I think <laughs> I think that's definitely something I've said more than a few times in the studio. <laughs> I mean, that's the simplest, most cliched version of it. Yeah. But that's but that's really you know I mean people have to believe the first half of that sentence. Yeah. Right. I mean he would just say like that that was great that was amazing and 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 you know but let's see if we can top it. Yeah. Right. Like that's it. We got it now. You know and that would be a trick too. Like that relaxes you. Right. It's like yeah. we have it. 
let's try one more. Let's let's just see. And that would sometimes. Oh, right now we don't have to worry about it. Uh, you know, we're just doing this for fun, and that would get a different thing. So as far as students are concerned, and I think students are also learning from the modeling that they're getting, mm. that that making creating that that experience of safety for them is primary and then they're going to be able to incorporate and take in new information and i'm over generalizing because there are some students who are obviously are so traumatized or so mm. sensitized that they're in such a state of of shame or self you know self denigration that they they're going to they're not going to be able to take in any any kind of feedback but generally speaking absolutely i think that that's the that's something that we I think a lot of educators tend to tend to forget mm. if they're seeing the thing that they want to, you know, teach, and they have to create that. Especially if you're working with music students who are, you know, artists are sensitive. Yeah. Well, th th this le leads me to another thing that I wanted to ask you about. Actually, yeah. is that you were saying it's kind of one of the great ironies of the music business that people who a lot of the time fundamentally have learned to become artists out of a kind of a deep insecurity which then leads them to want to perform to get that validation are then thrown into one of the most cutthroat businesses which actually offers countless opportunities to be humiliated and and obviously there's some some heartbreaking examples of that in in the book which which people can check out if they um if they pick up the book and, and read it but what would you maybe yeah maybe if you could just talk a little bit about that about the tension between the artist who needs validation and then the sort of the risks of performing and creating and you know before we get into that i just wanted to comment on something related in terms of the the relationship between the educator and the artist um i did a, a presentation at the creativity and madness conference on do you have to be a jerk to be a genius <laughs> <Right>. and, yeah <laughs> and this guy russell steinberg um contacted me after reading my book and he was talking he's a classical uh composer and conductor and he was talking about the great teachers the sort of the legendary teachers in that classical world mm. who were you know real jerks <laughs> yeah. i'm yeah. cleaning up my language here yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, that wasn't the word that he used you know yeah and and um and he named uh, several people, several ed teachers who were like that. And I think that that, so so there's there's also the uh, or if um, what's the 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 movie about the uh, the drummer? Uh, uh, Whiplash. Whiplash, right? Yeah. You know, there's a classic example of what what I'm talking about, right? So there's there's also that tradition, right? And I think especially in the arts mm. and in music, or if you're in cooking or something like that, where the great master is just an asshole, <laughs> and uh, and and the student has to you know learn how to tolerate that. And I think there's yeah. something to that, you know. Yeah. I I think that that. Um, uh, uh, you know, I don't know what the what the line is, um, and is that abuse necessary? No, absolutely not. And people need to feel safe to learn. But the the getting to to your question, it's it's also a very tough world. Yeah, if you're going to yeah. be in the business, and somehow you also have to learn how to you know how to take it because not everybody is going to be that yeah. careful with how they treat you. Yeah. Um, and and I've seen young folks kind of come into the studio, or or I've worked with them, and and they they give up so easily yeah. because they encountered difficult personalities, you know that uh, they're working with, and and uh, where the demands are very great. So I don't know exactly what what the line is there, yeah. but um, certainly uh, artists need to also learn how to. Uh, you know how to handle, yeah, all and, the rejection and right. and the, the the bad treatment that they're they're going to get. Yeah, I I almost wonder if there's um if there's a sort of a curve that that works where, like you say, you kind of need a safe space almost to learn the chops at right. the start to kind of to get yourself to a point where you have the skills necessary, right. and right. then when you reach that point, you almost then need to emerge and be tested. And it's I suppose okay. it's maybe. It's maybe a case, isn't it, of supporting people while they're in that developmental stage 
Right. And then giving, and I, I often find actually these things like I think back to kind of open mics within hip hop where you get the opportunity to get up and test right. out your lyrics and right. that being kind of simultaneously quite supportive, but also quite a challenge. Um, right. And I suppose you, you look back at jazz and you think of the, the kind of legendary sessions in New York where right. j- jazz musicians would get on the stage. Um, right. And there's there's all those rumors, aren't there, about the origins of jazz? That actually the changes in jazz were invented to keep the bad musicians off the stage. Right. <laughs> and um, I, I read something. I'm trying to remember if it was Art Blakey or it's one of those guys. And the, the rumor was that they invented these chords basically to keep this trumpet player they really didn't like off the stage by making him look bad. And then and then everyone was like, actually, those changes kind of sounded good. <laughs> right. <laughs> maybe we should maybe we should make something out of that. Right. Um, but um, but yeah, so. There's, yeah. There's a lot of competition. Yeah, and, 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 and you and, know and, that's part of the thing, right? Is is you're competing to to be you know to win. Yeah, and and but this this makes me think actually. Obviously, you worked with some legends of the yeah. of the kind of the, I suppose the history of, of music really. You, I mean, working with Dylan, Sinatra, Mick Jagger, um, and Paul Simon. Um, yeah, all all of those kind of artists, which I would say easily are in my you know top 10 artists so right. to to have had that experience or that window of of time and to work with those people and what really struck me in the book is how although they they all came across very differently in terms of your experience with them there were certain things they shared and then certain things which maybe set them apart and you yeah. obviously you get the feeling that there were ones you had a softer spot for than others shall we right. say right. Um, <laughs> but what what would you say with those kind of massive personalities, those kind of artists, what were the what were the different approaches? What were the similarities? How did how did you kind of have to modulate your approach to work with those different different approaches to creating you know legendary art? Right. Well, I would say that that to to generalize, first of all, the thing that that I would say is was common, most common around uh, of most of the artists that I worked with. Um, and this get, gets to that thing that we were just talking about of what's the line between sort of safety and um, challenge. Mm. Right? Maybe maybe the for the student they need uh, structure and support, which is an expectation, um, high very high expectations, but giving them what they need in order to achieve those expectations. And I think that that what I observed in in artists and we were defining this a client and I the other day where we came up with the five E's which was first of all they showed effort 110 percent effort Mm -hmm. uh, all of themselves into everything that they did Uh, and they did it with enthusiasm you know there was no moaning groaning whining they they (laughs) were you know they were all in with all of their love yeah you know and, and it was all in the pursuit of excellence. That's the third E, that, that there was never a time. The great artists that I worked with always had this, this vision that they were aiming towards, mm. right? So when the rest of us were b- begging for mercy, <laughs> we stopped, yeah. they were aiming towards something. Yeah. You know, and that was that standard of excellence, right? And the fourth thing was endurance, being able to do this over time. Yeah. So whether it was a 12-hour session to get a basic track, or working for an uh, for a year on an album, or whatever it took, you know, it it just they were able to endure and come in day after day. I didn't see that many, if any, flights of imaginative fancy. But yeah. what, I, what I saw was this dogged hard work, and there was a vision. You know, that was the thing that they knew that if they put that effort in with that enthusiasm, aiming for excellence over time, they were going to be. They had that faith. Mm. That they were going to find that lost chord, they were going to be able to create that thing. That they that there was something magical that was going to be there at the end of that process. Now, again, I didn't see them say, "Yay, we got it," because <laughs> they were always yeah. doubting. They were, you know, that that standard of excellence was never being satisfied. Yeah, and you know. That, that, so that, I would say that those were so. These people didn't see e- how each other worked. You know, they heard each other's records, right? Mm-hmm. So there was that competitive element of, um, you know, Paul Simon would hear the latest thing that Paul McCartney put out, and he wanted to top that. Or, yeah. you know, the Boys and the Beatles had their thing, or, or, or whoever it was that was competing at any particular time. But they didn't know how the other people were really working. But they had that, oh, by and large, mm-hmm. they had that common 
common things. Some work very fast, some work very slow. Um, and I think that that was different. So a Sinatra would, you know, if you didn't get him in the first take, yeah, you, you missed it, mm. and he'd be mad. Uh, Steely Dan, you know, would do a uh, hundred takes of a of a track, and you had to be able to endure that <laughs> that kind of thing. You know, each yeah. artist. But I think this also goes back to sort of your original question. Not only is it was it necessary to um, make each artist feel safe, but perhaps more specifically, it was attuning to the artist. Mm. You know, and I think that that's key in interpersonal relationships is is matching yourself to their experience. Right. So, so really following what that artist needed at any particular moment. And really being like a champion and a supporter and and going with their their flow, you know, yeah. how, they, how they worked. So whether that meant, you know, having to talk dirty over the talk back to inspire a vocal from a particular <laughs> female artist, you know, you do whatever it took, right? Yeah. Or, or, you know, uh, and, endure and, the and, painstaking and this, repetitive stuff. This, this brings me to another question um, that... Like you say, that you kind of always saw it as your role to support and encourage and, and help these artists to achieve their kind of, you know, find the lost chord, as you put it. Right. Um, but there are moments in the book where you're quite sure that they're on the wrong path and you know what they need to do. What did right. you do in those kind of situations where you're fairly certain they're headed towards the rocks and you kind of felt that you needed to, to steer them? Is what? How did you manage that kind of tension between helping them and you know, having a suspicion that maybe they weren't headed the right way. Right, right. So, um, first of all, you know, I think I think the main distinction there, of course, is being very, very clear about the 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 boundary uh, that dividing and defining line between an engineer and a producer. Mm, sure. So, as an, as an engineer, um, it was a very delicate thing. You know, maybe maybe through the producer you can sure. make some kind of comment, but generally speaking, it was not the role of the engineer to uh, to really have any kind of input like that. So you just, mm. if you were going towards the rocks, you know, you steered <laughs> for the rocks. Uh, and one great example of that, yeah. and people don't really, uh, you know, the, uh, Dylan freaks. Have have scrutinized this thing about the original New York tracks um, uh, for Blood on the Tracks. Um, that that Dylan was was hitting the buttons on his vest. Oh yeah, yeah. Playing, and you could hear the clacking of that on the tracks that that are still used from. Or, or if you listen to the to the bootlegs of the original tracks that weren't used, and people think that Ramon was the was the producer on that record, but he wasn't. He was the engineer, and Ramon was so scared of Dylan. <laughs> I mean, he was so Ramon was was quite cautious as a person in general in that sense, but he didn't. Um, he never said to Dylan, "Hey, you know, we got to do something about those buttons." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so no. they're just on there, you know. And people are like, why is that? Did he mean? Should it? Yeah. Was it a deliberate thing? No, it was. It was Ramon wasn't the producer, and he he was, he didn't he didn't feel that that in that circumstance with that artist yeah. that he could say something. Other artists, yeah, absolutely. And there's that <laughs> difference between one artist and and another. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, no, that's um. It's, it's really, and I love that that those those kind of like quirks of fate on these records that right. you can kind of if you know if you know what they are then you can kind of it tells part of the story.